Thank you all for joining us today for increasing the ROI of your 360 feedback process. Dale, I'll hand it over to you to get started. Thanks, Jesse, and thanks you all for joining. I'm uh, very excited to be uh, here talking about uh, a topic that comes up quite frequently uh, in the work I do. People often interested in, you know, how do we get uh, how do we get a better return on the on the investment that we're making in a what what seems to be a very valuable process, but trying to understand that in a little bit a little bit deeper way. So. Uh, yeah, so very excited to talk uh, talk to you today about this interesting topic. Um, uh, you know, I think one thing to to start off thinking about when you look at 360 degree feedback is to recognize sort of what it is and what it isn't. Uh, often people will talk about feedback as a gift, right? It's something that you give to somebody else. Certainly, if you look at our feedback uh, surveys and such, they're uh, voluntary. So the idea that Giving feedback to someone is a gift to help them improve, help them understand how they're doing, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, a better way to think about feedback, though, is to think about it as an investment. There's a little bit of a double entendre here because there's the investment that the feedback providers are giving, but of course there's the investment that that the HR and talent team are are, are putting into the process. But I think in both ways, if you think about 360 feedback as an investment and what can you do to increase the return, you're going to end up with a better, more effective process. So one of the things we often talk to uh, uh, participants, uh, leaders receiving the feedback is uh, in this paradigm is to say, look, it's an investment people have made in you. Give them a return. Show them that you're making a difference that they, so that they will continue to invest in you and continue to give you feedback. Uh, thank them for their feedback, things along these lines. I think at the individual level, very, very valuable. But of course, thinking about it as an investment and really being um, rigorous, I think a lot of talent management groups will look at 360 feedback as a, a process uh, that they're that they're in uh, that they're investing in that they're uh, de designing and delivering. But when they start being rigorous about what is the return I'm getting, and I and I don't mean, and we'll we'll, we'll talk about this. I don't mean you know, necessarily literally doing an ROI analysis. I think ROI analyses can be useful, but as, if anyone's ever done one, um, it's a little tricky because of the there's a lot of estimating going on. So short of giving a specific literal number, even just thinking about, and this is what we'll be doing today, what is that investment I'm making? And what is the return? And what can I do to get a better return on the investments that I'm making here is exactly the, the paradigm or the, or the frame. And so when you stop looking at 360 feedback as a sort of process with steps that you need to do and you start thinking about what's the benefit of those steps, what's the return we're getting on this option or that option, I think you end up with a much better process. So when we think about 360 degree feedback, let's get clear about what it is. One of the things our benchmark study uh, again and again shows is that everyone sort of does 360 differently. When a new client tells us, uh, we've got a 360 pre process we've had for a long time, the first thing we ask is, well, what do you mean? Because uh, it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, the way it's implemented varies quite widely. Of course, fundamentally, this is sort of what it looks like, right? An individual receiving feedback from multiple individuals uh, that they work with from different sources, different different buckets, if you will. And the key here is that it's not just the supervisor, right? You're getting beyond kind of the traditional model of, you know, your boss is the one that gives you feedback about where you are and how you're doing to expanding that view to a wider set of individuals. Uh, some colleagues of mine uh, uh, and I uh, recently put together uh, an article on kind of how how 360 was evolving or devolving. One of the first things we realized is when we started writing that article is we needed to kind of define it because of this dynamic that most people would agree that this is this is a 360 process. But what exactly is that getting at? So we actually uh, sat down and, and wrote out a definition that got very specific, and it's worth touching on just briefly to be clear. And you'll see in a bit why uh, why this is important. I think um, when you realize what some folks are out there doing and calling 360 feedback, it's fairly remarkable. So. The way we defined it was around um, collecting and quantifying, very important there, quantifying that you actually have a numeric uh, data that you can use to compare, and reporting coworker observations. So not family members, um, really the workplace environment is critical there. Recognizing that these are observations, these are not necessarily uh, facts. They tend to, they're much more about perception and observation. 
um, of a particular individual. We call them ratees. Um, uh, and then the, the key point here being that this process is used to create sustainable individual and group-wide change. That it's not a report card that says how you did in a class. It's not you got a B plus based on the work you've done in the past, and there you have a B plus or an A minus, whatever it is. It's information that you can use, maybe about how you've done uh, in the past and how you're doing now, but for the purpose of creating change and doing better in the future. And I think that forward-looking aspect of it is really critical, particularly when you start thinking about ROI and you start thinking, well, what, what are we doing to move change forward? How, what are we doing to improve leaders? How can we help make that process better? A couple of other key components, though. Again, I talked about this idea of rater perceptions, right? That the idea is to, to in a 360 process, is to facilitate uh, rater perceptions that can be understood from the perspective of what are their specific behaviors that they are seeing that are valued by the organization. And importantly, here, you, you want some notion of what degree to which a leader is 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 uh, exhibiting these behaviors or not. Um, there are folks that have done sort of what they call 360 processes that end up with categorical, you know, this person is a this or this person is a that. Uh, and really that doesn't do you much good. It really is more a gradation of how well or um, and how much better you might be able to be doing on a particular set of behaviors. The important point for the valued by the organization, again, very much overlooked, actually. Just last week, I was on the East Coast talking to a large group of, uh, of universities about this, that, that the notion is you can use um, the behaviors that in within a 360 to communicate what is valued by the organization. You can, you can use it to message out, but also to shape where you want your leaders to go, and that starts creating that organizational level change that, that I talked about. The other important point, and this shows up, and this is where the quantification is important and where just doing, for example, uh, interview-based process is quite limited can certainly augment a, a, a quanti quantified 360 and can be very valuable. But if you if you, you need to be able to make meaningful comparisons between groups. And so the idea is I want to understand how do I show up differently as a leader with my peers as compared to how I show up with my customers, as compared to how I show up with my direct reports. And I may be very different in all of those. So understanding the different comparisons is critical. So this is what we're talking about with when we're talking about 360s. The question then is, if you've got a process that you've designed around these kind of rigorous um, um, methods or, or, or um, uh, an approach, how do you improve the effectiveness of that process from an ROI perspective? So let's look at what ROI is. Often ROI, uh, you know, people get, uh, again, a little bit loose in their thinking around what ROI is. This is sort of the official formula, and I promise I will not get into fractional computations here and how you compute ROI per se, but it's important to recognize the two critical components in ROI. People often will look at how do I improve ROI and they'll think about it in terms of decreasing cost. And you know, cost is clearly one of the two important elements of ROI you've got to think about and that can have some effect. But uh, the premise we're going we're gonna to talk about today is the notion that, that if you really want to make that pivot, if you really want to level up your art, the best thing to do is increase your benefits. So if you can improve the impact of ROI, of course, within, with you know, uh, mindfulness around cost, that's where you're going to have your greatest benefit. And it's uh, clearly the notion here is let's, let's uh, spend uh, money on things that have the greatest impact, right? So if you can spend a dollar, spend it on the thing that is going to have much bigger impact rather than the thing that's going to have less impact. So what I'm going to focus on is what are those benefits and what are those key areas that you can get the bigger impact? Where should you most be investing in, in, in your program to make the biggest impact from that perspective, again, of change and particularly sustainable change in those observable behaviors valued by the organization? So let's take a closer look at what those uh, what those costs and uh, and benefits are. So costs are things, of course, like setting up. You've got to do some sort of customization, orientation often overlooked, but introducing the program to to individuals. Obviously, the fees in terms of reports. Uh, also often overlooked is employee time to complete surveys. 
the more surveys that get completed, you're, you're typically paying employees while they're filling out those surveys. So, uh, and if nothing else, it's opportunity loss. They could be spending time doing other things. So while more surveys is better, the better, you know, more targeted surveys is, is even more important. And then, of course, the time it takes for employees to process the information and then do some, some real action planning to create change. These are all the kinds of costs to look at. Often the dollars that you know that uh, uh, expenses are the ones that are most attended to, but you really have to look more broadly at these other issues. Now, when you think about benefits, and of course there are a lot of kind of cultural, climate-related benefits in terms of improving the performance-oriented conversations that are happening and that sort of thing. Um, really, the fundamental benefit, the thing that 360 gives you that other things do not, is accurate talent management decisions. Now, there's a lot out there about development only versus administrative decisions. Uh, I, we're starting to look at it more in terms of kind of a continuum so that there are decisions being made using 360 feedback, whether it's which training course to attend or how to uh, shape my leadership. Do I start by trying to be better at delegating or do I start by going to presentation courses to learn how to communicate better? Um, knowing which, you know, accurately which of these is going to make the biggest impact based on that wider set of data points is going to get your, your better ROI. So when you think about how do I improve ROI, certainly the cost is easy to find. The benefits, how do I make sure that what I'm doing, the activities that we're doing, are leading to better decisions about how to develop? And then, of course, there's the question of, the development actually getting done and applied and things like that. So, so let's let's play play around with what are those uh, ways that we can really increase the benefits, that, the outcome that we're getting from the 360 process. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bucket that into sort of three different uh, categories of ways that you can increase those benefits. The first is more feedback, right? So already, just a 360 process, you're looking at not just getting feedback from your boss, but getting more feedback from more people. Uh, and so what are the ways that we can do things like increase response rates, that sort of thing, so that we're getting more uh, feedback? Of course, more is good, but better is better. So you know, how do we get better feedback? How do we get better, more, more useful feedback that can more easily be translated into leadership uh, change so that leaders understand it, accept it, and actually see a path toward improving? Um, you know, if you give somebody very vague feedback, you know, uh, one of my favorites is you'll read a comment that'll say something like, what should he do better? And it'll say, communication. And you go, OK, well. Is that listening or speaking? Right there, you don't know. So better feedback. How do you get better feedback is going to be key. And then importantly, and, and, and this is really critical for talent management groups, I think often, particularly given what the complexity can be, certainly if it's in a large organization, it could be a very complicated process. But one of the key moments is that people will tend to focus perhaps on how do we get more feedback, survey administration? How do we get better feedback, content, and, and, um, and the way people are providing feedback? Then what they overlook is, what do they do with the feedback? So once they've gotten the report, that's when the job really begins for talent management. And I think a lot of times organizations get sort of stop at the point of getting the report and don't realize that it's after the report happens that the real change occurs. And that's really an important place to invest and, and to tweak and improve your process. So I'm going to look at a bunch of different practices and strategies that we can use in each one of these three areas to, to level up the benefits that we're getting from, from uh, our 360 process. So let's start with more feedback. So here's a, a particular individual, the folk, the, the, we'll call him Joe here, that was uh, I, I had up a moment ago. And you can see here Joe is going to get feedback on his report from a number of different folks. In this case, he's got seven feedback providers, not including himself, who are giving him feedback. If he gets uh, each of these individuals completing surveys about him, uh, he's going to get a particular view of where he needs to improve and what he needs to do to, to be a better leader. Now, if you take a look at some of these folks, uh, I think you can see in particular in the peer group, the direct report group, and then the other group, uh, there's at least one individual there who may not have the most positive things to say about Joe. 
The other interesting thing about this particular set of feedback is uh, there are only two individuals from each of these separate groups that responded. Now, a pretty common standard, our benchmarks that I think found 87% of companies use three as the minimum from each group to be able to report uh, feedback so that you're protecting the anonymity of the, of the raters. Um, so if, this, if we were to run a report for Joe based on this feedback, he actually wouldn't get separate data based on each of those individual groups. He'd get all of it grouped up, and then maybe he'd see the supervisor separately. So he'd get kind of a, you know, a combined aggregate of all these. But he wouldn't get that ability, as we talked about in the definition, to differentiate between how he behaves with his direct reports compared to, say, how he behaves with his peers. So he's got kind of two challenges here. One, he's sort of oversampled, perhaps, by some of these, um, we'll call them grumpy folks, uh, technical term there. Uh, and then he also is not getting enough feedback to really get the separation. So what can we do in our process to increase the amount of feedback that he's getting so that it might look something more like this? He's got a much more balanced view, and you can imagine, again, a feedback report with these folks filling it out is going to look a lot different than, uh, in, than that prior group, that prior subset. So making sure that you get a full enough set to be able to see differences between groups, but also keep in mind that even if we look at our even if we look at our direct report group, uh, pardon me, uh, even if we look at our direct report group here, the direct report group is uh, you know going to look a lot different, right? The, the the if you've got two folks, the grumpy guy and then the kind of happy guy, filling out your survey. Uh, in your direct report group, it's going to the feedback is going to look radically different than if all five of your direct reports provide you feedback. So Joe's not going to get a really clear perspective on uh, on where where he's actually uh, succeeding or or struggling as a leader if only two of his direct reports fill it out. He really needs to see that full set. So what can we do to get Joe more more feedback so that he gets that more full view? A couple different strategies. One thing to recognize in 360 is that the, the transparency is important, particularly process transparency. So people, things like people knowing where the report is going to go. So when I fill out this survey, who's going to get it? Is it going to go to Joe's boss, or is it just going to go to Joe? Um, what's going to happen with it? Is this going to be used to determine his pay, or is this just for him to develop? So being very clear with the people providing feedback and also the people receiving feedback about the process, who's going to get what, what's the purpose of this, that's where that orientation comes in, and it can be done electronically. There are a lot of different ways to do orientation. Again, our benchmark study finds a, a pretty wide range, depending a lot on the organization. Some organizations where there's very low trust, you want to do an in-person, live orientation where uh, ideally an outside in, uh, 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 consultant can come in and kind of talk about what the process is, answer questions. We've done these where we literally had all, all managers leave the room so that only raters could, could ask questions um, because that particular organization just had really low trust. Other organizations where they've used the process before, trust is high, they just need to know the facts. That can probably be done a little bit more electronically. But don't overlook the notion of, um, of transparency. If people understand what the, how their data are going to be used, they're going to be more likely to contribute. If they're not, they may be a little more hesitant and find something else to do that day. So transparency, be open about how the data are going to be used. Uh, the other one, and, and this sounds really simple, but really targeting reminders. So you're going to invite people. Typically, it's going to be an email format uh, where you're sending out invitations to individuals and saying, hey, you know, Joe would like some feedback. Well, make sure that's targeted to the right individuals. So you can do things like, um, you know, to the feedback recipients themselves, you can give them feedback along the way to say, hey, you know, you don't have enough raters yet, Joe. Send out a notice to all your raters who were invited and ask them for feedback so they know and they can do the kind of follow-up. When Joe sends out an email to all of his direct reports and says, hey, please give me feedback. I'm really looking forward to this feedback and trying to get better as a leader, it's a lot different than, than if just uh, a system is sending an email out to those raters. So maybe the system gets those first two raters, but the, the email from Joe might motivate those direct reports to realize, oh, he's really taking this seriously. I do want to give him feedback. The other thing you can do uh, is level it up a little. Send Joe's boss a, uh, a an email saying, hey, Joe hasn't yet identified his raters, and if we don't get them by such and such date, 
uh, he won't be able to participate in this process. The boss ought to be pretty motivated for Joe to get feedback, and 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 so uh, the boss is going to appreciate that and be able to follow up with Joe and say, hey, you know, go and pick your rater so we can get you into this process. Uh, you, you know, I want to make sure you're getting the feedback you need to improve. And then making sure that HR has the information they need about who has and hasn't completed raters, because particularly if it's a programmatic type approach, uh, you, what you don't want to do is to sort of automatically shut off the process and then have HR look and realize, oh, wait a minute, you know, people aren't even really getting differentiated feedback. I would have extended the, the deadline another week because we had some big event come up. So making sure that each person in the process has the information they need to be able to get that more feedback is, is absolutely critical. Again, if you think about the arc over the process, interestingly, it's not just about invitations and, and, and whatnot. It's also about after. So if we think about that investment. Um, it's amazing what uh, thanking the feedback providers can do. So we always recommend that leaders go back to the people that provided them feedback or may have provided them feedback, at least that rater list, and say, thank you for the feedback, right? Again, it's an investment. This is where that investment mentality makes a huge difference because you're saying, thank you for the feedback. This is the thing I'm working on. I heard from my feedback that the most important thing for me to do is to give uh, more autonomy and to delegate better. I'm going to be working on that. I appreciate your help in discovering this. I will be trying to get better at that. All of a sudden, as a feedback provider, the, the paradigm changes completely because I realize, wow, Joe's paying attention. He listened to the feedback. He has a plan. This is being used. Now I want to invest more. The next time that process comes around, I'm going to realize this is a process where I'm going to get a return on my investment of feedback. So having uh, feedback uh, recipients thank their feedback providers can make a huge difference ongoing in terms of the way they get and use feedback. There also are a bunch of system tools that ought to be in place. And I think certainly, uh, you know, way back when we started doing this, we were sending out, you know, uh, thousands of paper surveys and envelopes and receiving them in the mail and a whole different ballgame now. If you don't have a certain set of system tools in place, you're not going to be able to get the kind of um, kind of feedback that you that you really need Joe to get. So things like um, make sure you know, sound simple, but collaborate with your IT department. Make sure that that website is whitelisted. It's amazing how many times that can be a challenge where the HR department is um, not working well enough with the IT department to make sure there's access and that fluid uh, fluid process. With some of the, you know, and, and at the at the higher volume, you know, larger stuff, even stuff like single sign-on, et cetera. But just make sure there's a smooth collaboration. In a sense, IT needs to know this is coming. Uh, it's not an IT process, but it is IT facilitated. So some involvement from them is important. Another thing that can make a huge difference, we found this just really impacts response rates significantly, is to pipe feedback recipient names into the subject line. So uh, if you're providing feedback to Joe, the subject line says, Joe would like feedback from you. That is much more meaningful than, hey, you've got some 360 surveys. So it's very tailored, very custom. If done right, it may even be uh, that the person has, you know, five, six people that they're uh, being asked to provide feedback on, and in that case, it ought to say, you know, Joe, Jane, Bob, Bill, and 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 Jill have all asked for feedback. That's a very tailored, custom message that's going to have a lot more impact and 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 be likely to increase your your URL. Simple things like a custom URL, the right colors, the branding. Stuff like that makes people feel this is a real, you know, valid process, part of our company. It feels like it fits a lot better, and that kind of customization can make a big difference. Um, we've had a lot of uh, uh, success with HTML emails, particularly for leadership programs, where the program itself has some sort of an acronym and it's well branded and recognized with the organization. Having that sense of kind of customization can again make it make make those emails. Um, feel more authentic and and more well targeted, uh, just a lot a lot more um, likely to have those emails open and surveys completed. Um, the other thing is really using uh, you know in our case we call um, a task list where where if I'm providing feedback 
uh, to Joe and Jill and Jane and Bill, I, I get one email. I don't get five emails, one for each one of them, and I have to track it and get the right password and the right person. I get one email saying, hey, log into the system. It's amazing how simply, something simple as that can make a big difference. Um, also including an HR contact. Occasionally people will have questions, so when they get that email, it ought to say, hey, you know, if you've got questions about the process, the process owner at Acme Corp is, you know, uh, Jane Doe, you can reach out to her at X number. The truth is that rarely happens. When it does, you want them to have asked the question. So making sure that those, ta those messages are tailored. Um, and then lastly, just something as simple as making sure you've got that live pool of Raider emails in there so that people can see, oh, look, all the emails from my company are in here. I don't have to type them all out. And this is clearly a legitimate process. You know, people are more and more sensitive to, is this email legit or is it not? So you can see a lot of these system tools are oriented toward helping people see this is a valuable process, it's legit, it's going to make a difference for Joe. So system tools shouldn't be overlooked. It's not the end-all, be-all, but it can make a big difference. Uh, last point I want to I want to touch on here is um, the length of the survey. So mm, survey length is kind of an interesting one. Uh, we've seen surveys for 360s as short as 12 questions. Uh, I would argue that you're going to be falling well short of the amount of feedback that you need if you've got only 12 questions. We've seen them as long as 150. If you have 150 survey item uh, survey items in your survey, your response rate will come very very low. <laughs> So uh, typically we recommend sort of 50 to 70. It's a it's a big number, but um, we can usually usually folks can complete those surveys anywhere from five to seven minutes each, and a little bit of time invested on behalf of Joe that goes beyond just say 12 questions can make a difference. What our benchmark study finds is uh, that that the number of surveys uh, uh, survey questions actually varies a little bit based on whether it's by development or performance management. Performance management oriented surveys tend to be a lot shorter. Uh, development focused ones tend to be a lot longer. Um, but again, that sort of 40 to 50 range is pretty is a pretty typical, a typical number. So making sure that it's right sized, I will say there's a lot of pressure right now on shorter, 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 shorter. The challenge is um, shorter doesn't get you the depth you need. So it's a, t a delicate balance between depth and valuable feedback and making it quick and easy. Uh, one of the best things you can do is actually shorter items so that you're not writing out three sentence items that take forever for people to rate. So what is a good response rate? Uh, what is sort of typical or good? Uh, we track that pretty closely here. So I wanted to give you kind of a range or a sense of it. Um, you know. Anything below 50%, you're really going to have some challenges interpreting the data. You've got something very subpar. Up to 70% is probably OK, but again, you've got to be careful in thinking about, well, did I get the too many of the grumpy ones or too many of the super happy ones or how representative is it? So really, we're typically looking for you know 70 plus percent, and, and you want to be pushing above that. What we find is we get almost 90% response rate. That's kind of the target that we shoot for. So trying to get it up in that upward, you know, upward percentile is, is pretty, uh, pretty important. Um, I would say paying attention to those response rates is also pretty important. If you're not paying attention to them, you're not going to get the impact you want. Okay, so let's keep moving. Move on to the better feedback. Better feedback, of course, um, you know, is again, comes to all kinds of issues in terms of the content that you're covering, uh, the, 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 the investment people make, how careful they are in writing their comments. Do they write just communication or do they spell out a whole list of real specifics? So a couple different strategies. The first one critically is relevant content. Make the content relevant to the job. I'm not kidding. I have actually seen this survey item. It was certainly not a survey uh, item that we used, but it was a, another organization that was referring to this 360 process and they literally had a question of the of the following dogs, which one would, in this case, Dale be? If you're asking questions like this, uh, or even you know remotely related to this, all kinds of challenges. First of all, what does ever you know? What does it mean if uh, if one person thinks I'm a um, a uh, you know Doberman Pinscher and the other one thinks that I'm a 
uh, a collie. What's the, what does that even mean? Well, one person's version of that is completely different than another person's. Also, what does that have to do with my job? So making them really relevant, and I'm imagining not too many folks are using a question like this, but still making, being thoughtful about behavioral questions that are going to reliably measure the same behavior so that if you say something like, listens to others attentively, nice clean behavior, pretty much everyone's going to have the same interpretation of what listens to others attentively means, and you're going to have a reliable, stable data set. So make sure your content is relevant. It's relevant to the job even. We've seen folks at universities using, um, using items that talk about customers. Well, that doesn't really fit that culture well. Maybe you want to shift that language to you know, more like students or something along those lines. In a healthcare setting, you probably want to reference patients. So making sure the content fits the context, absolutely critical. Other important element is who is providing the feedback, right? So if you exclude, for example, your direct reports, but you get a bunch of feedback about delegation, you might be missing the boat there. So making sure that you have the right raters for the right content and the right purpose uh, making sure that rater selection is done in a way that the person getting the feedback values the feedback from the people that provided it. Uh, if someone else selects, we've seen processes where HR selects the raters based on HRIS system, they get their feedback and they realize, oh, well, I don't, none of these people report to me anymore. That was last year, the HRIS just didn't get updated. Well, oops, how are we doing on our feedback? Not so good. Investment and change, not so good. So making sure you got the right raters, um, you know, that, that the process for selecting raters is good. And particularly, we, we recommend typically that you're including um, the boss in this conversation, if not actually having them approve the rater through the system so that you the boss is already engaged in, in Joe's feedback and his, his development. Um, you want to get enough raters to, go back to our example before, where you get more than uh, three responses from each category so you can look at those separately. Well, if you invite only three people, the chances are not all of them are going to be able to do it. 100% is pretty tough. So we usually recommend you know, five to seven raters to make, per group to make sure you get the right, um, the right set of data. And then in particular, making sure you invite all direct reports. In no case should a leader have direct reports excluded from their feedback unless perhaps they just started a couple weeks ago, something like that. So making sure the people providing feedback uh, are the right people and there are enough of them, absolutely critical. Um, Rater training is also really important. Um, it's one of the key variable, or one of the key uh, findings that we've had in our field is that rater training can make a big difference. So uh, is rater training common? Um, it is relatively common. It's in lots of different forms. So one of the trends that we've seen, you can see here the no training line in our, in our benchmarking data, um, finds that, that really people uh, maybe in the past were doing a lot less of it, but it's very much on the rise. And it shows up in a lot of different forms. It can be an email, it could be a text, in some cases in-person training, that's obviously a lot more costly. Um, but with the right context where trust isn't, isn't good or familiarity isn't good or it's the very first time a process has been done, in-person training can be very, very valuable and certainly very effective at getting that accuracy. You know, what does a five mean? What does a three mean? You want to make sure you cover topics uh, around how to complete the survey. You've got to cover common rating errors. These things can be done relatively quickly and easily, but just cueing people into the idea of don't give everybody all fives, use the whole scale, can make a big difference in the kind of um, rating variability you get. The other big one is um, writing comments. We have done a bunch of studies where we've found that uh, comment quality is often quite poor. People, leaders often value the comments, but the quality of them, if you really look through the thousands of comments that get generated, can be pretty variant. And so uh, you can put some instructions in or do some rater training to really give people an idea of how, what is a good comment. Turns out communication, mm, maybe not quite specific enough. Maybe it needs to be more clear. You know, listen, listen to others more carefully. I notice in particular that you don't listen to your direct reports. That is a useful comment that gives a leader something they can work with, much more so than communication. So comment writing can make a big difference in the quality of the, of, of the comments. 
so, and embedding these instructions, so for example, we often use a, a, a short six or so minute video that uh, people can complete uh, or look, look at right before they fill surveys out. It's not required, but if you've got five surveys to fill out, if you take an extra six minutes to c get an idea of what the process is about and what those rating errors might be and how you can provide more accurate feedback, you're going to get a lot better impact in terms of the, the quality of the, of the ratings quantitatively and then also the comments. So it can be done in, in, in some efficient ways, um, but, but don't overlook the, the, the impact, the benefit that you can have from this kind of training. Um, as I mentioned, the comment guidelines in particular are really, really helpful. Um, you know, this is a, a good example where, you know, good communication, even if it's a longer comment, uh, it just isn't going to have quite the impact than if you really lay out some of the detail of what a good comment looks like and what some of the, the guidelines are for giving those good comments. All right, so let's jump to um, what you do once the report is in. So what, when we get beyond the feedback, so the, the report, the feedback has been provided, the report has been received, that in many ways is where the action begins, right? That's where you really don't want to leave your investment short. You can get all the way to, we got you got you the feedback, so why didn't you do something with it? Well, a lot of good reasons for that, and the big Big, one of the biggest reasons is that the process stopped there. There was no attention afterwards. There was nothing that got done after the report was done. And you just can't assume that leaders are going to get feedback and automatically use it productively to create change. Now, clearly, there are some leaders. There is a small set of leaders who are feedback hungry, who are sophisticated enough to read through the feedback and do something productive with it. But what we know is that giving some guidance and support at that point can make a big, big difference in terms of the way people are, are um, using the feedback. And at the end of the day, feedback use is the, is the point, right? You don't just want to give people feedback. Uh, you know, you want them to use the feedback. So using the feedback is the key. Interesting statistic here, we do a, a consortium of, of 360 um, uh, professionals that do 360 degree feedback in a wide range of, of, of companies and we get together a couple couple times a year and one of the most amazing moments for me uh, in hearing one of the presentations out was an organization that said that they had a very large process, thousands and thousands of reports being done, thousands of managers getting feedback. But when they looked back at one point they were asked, you know, well, you know, should we do more of this, should we do less, should we target it? And so they started doing a little evaluation, looking at some of the, the statistics. They found that 27% of the managers that had gone through the process never even opened the report. You know, they could see sort of how many people had downloaded it. Again, not a process we were involved in. But if, if, if over a quarter of the people that you've gone to all this effort to give feedback don't even open the report, it's a pretty good bet they're not actually using the report. So you got to be asking yourself questions like, did, you know, are our leaders even looking at them? Do they understand the feedback? Have they accepted that the feedback is legitimate and could be useful for them to use? If they don't, that's the linchpin to change, right? Acceptance that the feedback is valuable and they could use it to improve, absolutely critical. What percentage of those leaders actually created a plan or came up with a new direction to focus on? Did they talk with their boss? And then have they actually made any change? So asking some of these questions and looking at your program, and some of them can be a little more involved than others. Others, things like have they looked at their report, have they talked with their boss, um, those can be a much, much easier. So I think one of the basic questions is start asking yourself, are they using it after they get the feedback, after they get the report? But again, how do you, you know, how do you use that? Once I get a, a leader to the point where they're aware of their issues, they're aware of what they do great, and they can emphasize those, they're aware of where they might have some significant gaps, how do you get them to actually change behavior? Certainly action planning is a key point, but moving them from one to the next, uh, really coaching is where you're going to find that, that impact, right? It doesn't need to be a six-month executive coaching engagement to get somebody to really understand and accept the feedback as legitimate and something they could use to create an action plan. What we find is that when given left to their own devices, leaders tend not to be making this next step. So some effort at getting them some 
um, accountability around um, uh, accept for accepting the feedback through the coach's key. And then accountability becomes particularly important to that coach around behavior change. So if I've, if I've created the action plan, oh, I'm going to be better at delegating and empowering, but no one's paying attention afterwards. There's no follow-up effort. There's no direction about what delegating might look like. It gets much, much more difficult to, to, to create change. So some attention to uh, this back-end process and recognizing the, the value in, from, a, from a benefit standpoint. I mean, I would actually make the case that if you're getting people feedback and then you're not giving them even just a one-hour debrief with a coach, not someone who can read through the report, but an actual coach, they can help them understand what they need to change, you're probably not getting the benefit that justifies the effort uh, to, do the, to do the feedback. As a matter of fact, I would argue that it's a key ingredient, that coaching is not a nice to have, it's absolutely critical. And about two-thirds of the organizations agree. When we look when we look back over time, we find that um, this is even more common, that, that it's two-thirds of the, of, the, of the organizations are typically doing coaching. And when I say coaching, again, I want to emphasize that what I'm talking about is this one-on-one -on -one moment where somebody can sit there and say, I don't get it, this doesn't make sense, help me understand, get them to that place of acceptance, and then, oh, okay, now that I get it, what do I do? And in one hour, you can absolutely get somebody to that place. If you don't give them that, the folks that are not self-motivated are simply going to fall into that 27%. Maybe they opened it, but they sure didn't do anything with it. And if your purpose is to get them to do something with it, you've got to give them this kind of support to follow up. Again, what we find is that this is pretty consistently 60 to 70% over a very long period of time of organizations are providing some sort of one-on-one -on -one follow up coaching. So I would greatly encourage you to consider that as, a, in fact, an, an essential part of the process. Now the other thing you can do is uh, you can use this for a training needs analysis. So when you start looking kind of broadly in terms of what kind of impact and benefit can we have for the organization, if you look at all of your leaders and what they're focusing on, you can start understanding what you need to provide training in. So for example, a lot of times what we'll do after a process, we'll have that one hour debrief, the coach will write up a set of notes. Usually it's, it's no more than three, um, usually three, one to three key development priorities for that individual custom tailored to that person where they say, oh right, this person needs to be focusing on delegation. As a talent manager, you can look across all your leaders and say, well, what are those development priorities that they're working on? And when you realize that uh, an indivi individuals have been identified as needing delegation in this example, you can put out a, a, a workshop, one two-hour workshop specifically tailored to delegation to give them extra skills and whatnot. Again, getting added benefits to the organization. One thing I would say is I don't typically recommend using just the uh, the feedback scores. The feedback scores can be useful, but finding out what, when, when, when a coach talked to each manager and they discussed the feedback in context, what did they see emerge as the key development priorities for this person? It doesn't always show up as a simple numeric algorithm. A lot of times the context makes a big difference in determining that indeed it's delegation that may show up, even though delegation may not be, you know, even in their top 10 of items, because it's just from that direct report group, for example. So be careful, I would focus more on coach notes and that sort of thing. And then again, you can look at, well, and, and this is actually an example uh, from, from a client that we worked with over the course of eight years. We look, we were able to look back and say, across these eight years, what are the big things that emerge as the issues that your leaders need focus on? And then here's a list of them. So for this particular organization, this became a very useful kind of curriculum guide, if you will. Other benefits that you can get, again, after that report is done, you know, you've got the report, you've done the coaching, how do you get that impact and the benefit and increase those benefits? You can use uh, a 360 process as part to support your talent review, right? It's not necessarily going to be um, an individual level benefit, this is going to be a group level benefit. So using, uh, if you're doing sort of a nine block review, use the 360s 
my advice is to use, frankly, the coaches that worked with them in that talent review conversations, so they can again put the feedback in context. They know the individuals. They know the. They know what that feedback is about, and they know where they need to focus. So that's often kind of a, a really high impact, you know, uh, uh, use of feedback that's that's overlooked. So I've given you lots of detail, lots of sort of specific strategies uh, in particular elements of the process, right? Everything from you know, system tools all the way to uh, how coaching can support uh, the process. Um, one example I want to give you that's not not sort of specific to each individual um, notion. We did a we were actually featured in a Forbes article last year that talked about kind of the storyline. So if you're trying to get a sense of well, how can 360 have the greatest impact, and what does it look like, and what does that success look like? This is a really interesting example of where 360 a 360 process made a huge difference and can make a huge difference. A little bit more of a story than, than some of these specific facts and figures, but I, I recommend you take a look at it. It's a good, um, I mean, it's great, of course, that it featured us, but I think it's a really good descriptor of like what does, how does the process have that kind of impact that we're trying to make? How is it that the process can achieve those goals? And, and, and what we do know is that the one thing you don't want to do is to invest but fall short of investing in the things that are going to make the biggest difference. So again, if we go back to our major theme here, the major theme is giving a, a feedback isn't a gift. It's not just, here you go, good luck. Really think about it as an investment and what are the elements of this process that we need to make sure are in place to get the kind of impact that we know it can have, again, if you look at that Forbes article, it's a good example, but that we know it can have if we put the investments in the right place. As I've talked about, um, the, the bottom line uh, is there are sort of three big buckets. Focus on the benefits, think about each of these different components. What are we doing to make sure people get enough feedback? What are we doing to make sure they get really good feedback? And what are we doing after they get that report? If you are looking at each of these areas and your process is not uh, not invested in well, you're likely not getting the kind of return um, that you'd like to get and that the process has promise for. So don't invest short, invest for the long term and these focus on these three elements. That's where you're going to get your greatest impact. All right, so let me turn it over, uh, see if there, I've, I've been going on and on, let's see if there are any questions uh, that have emerged as I've been talking and, and um, what other uh, elements I've, I've overlooked that I'd be happy to, to answer questions about. Hi, Dale. We do have a few questions. Um, if you have other questions that you haven't typed in, feel free to enter them now. So someone asked, what are your thoughts on, um, sort of a two-part question, what are your thoughts on participants writing their own items is the first part, and um, the second part is raters taking a survey on multiple participants at once. Right. So two, again, if you think back to kind of the, the olden days when it was all paper surveys, clearly a single, uh, you know, a single survey attached to a single person, very rigid. The technology we have now allows us to do all kinds of things. I actually wrote a piece called The Can Do and the Should Do of, of Technology and 360 Feedback. So we can do a lot of things. Um, we can have individuals write their own items. And I think there are certain processes that are out there, feedback tools that are not 360 feedback, where this can be useful. So there are sort of, you know, um, uh, light feedback tools where you can do a presentation and then send out a thing, say, hey, how did I do on that presentation? And to me, that's where that sort of self-written kind of opportunity arises uh, and can be useful. But when you're doing a 360 feedback process, you lose some significant benefits when people are writing their own items. So particularly, standardizing across the organization starts to kind of fall down because not everybody's being asked the same question. All that training needs analysis benefit out the window. Um, the ability to drive and communicate the behaviors that are expected of leaders out the window. The other challenge we have with the with the self rating self written questions is um, well I guess two really one um, we put a lot of effort in with our clients to writing very clear behavioral specific questions and uh, to be honest it's a it's a it's a it's a science and an art you know, measurement is tricky. So getting really well written questions that are clearly understood by raters and actionable by leaders is difficult. 
Um, my guess is that you're going to end up with a few questions that are, um, if I was a dog, what kind of dog would I be uh, when people are writing their own questions? So you got to be really careful about the, the quality there. And even when we, again, go back to the notion of open-ended comments, people don't have a discipline around this. So I, I recommend um, really avoiding the self questions unless it's for kind of a um, you know again that kind of light feedback process that's maybe ongoing um, but not quite the rigor of a 360 process. Now in terms of the multi rater uh, process so people may or may not be familiar with this but you can I'll go back to my example where you know you've got five people that you're providing feedback on Joe, Bill, Jane, Bob, etc. Uh, you can you can rate Joe all on all 50 behaviors and then go back in and rate Jill on all 50 behaviors. But then, of course, the technology set up now where you could you can rate Joe, Jill, et cetera, all kind of at once. So the behavior is listens to others attentively, and you can rate Joe on that, and then Jill on that, and then Bill on that. And it looks very snappy and cool. Uh, can have some useful uh, utility. We have a, a, a team-based tool that, that's really effective for this, but it's very specific. Um, the truth is that it slows you down. Um, this is it, People think it's faster because it looks like it would be, but if you have to think about Joe and Jill and Bob on the behavior listening, it, you're changing your, your thinking a bunch of different times and it becomes difficult. Um, if you get into a mindset around Joe, you're really thinking about Joe. Your your brain is activated around your experiences with Joe, and you can you can level set within Joe and give him some really good feedback. So it it's quicker to do it uh, separately than it is to do it together. But certainly, um, it's a fun looking widget. <laughs> okay. So the other question we had was, um, could you say a little bit more about how managers can support the process after leaders receive their feedback? Yeah, I think again one of the most overlooked benefits of 360 is you now have a process where managers can be given a support tool for developing their own direct report. So if we go back to Joe, if well and and I would say actually managers could be involved and should be involved early on. So the manager, Joe's manager should be involved in helping Joe identify the right raters and enough raters already invested in the process early on. And then once the report is done, uh, I wouldn't necessarily give the manager the data themselves, but I would have the ma manager held accountable for meeting with Joe and saying, Joe, what did you learn from your feedback, and what, what are you going to be working on? I see, I see the coach here identified these three things. Tell me more about that. Let's talk about what I can do to help support you in being better at delegating. Now, the great part about this is that the boss themselves probably has their own development needs around how to uh, develop their team and so now you've given them a great process for doing a structured um, way of helping Joe and their other direct reports to improve so it's not just Joe who's benefiting from this it's actually Joe's boss that now has a structured process for developing talent and so in fact your benefits and they're not just to Joe but to the boss as well so uh, I think the including the boss and thinking about the benefits and how are we engaging them is absolutely critical Okay, I think that's all we have time for today, but thank you all for your questions. If you have individual questions that we didn't address here, feel free to reach out to us at 510-463-0333. Visit our website where we have a lot of other resources on 360-degree feedback. Thank you again, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.